Good afternoon, everyone. Assuming it's in the afternoon where you are located, uh, that's there. But I uh, can see a few people with video. It's nice to see everyone. I hope everyone is happy and healthy and safe. Um, but uh, we're going to get started on our session. So uh, this session here is going to be dealing with scheduling uh, for personal competency-based education. Um, so just kind of get started on this. Just want to uh, introduce ourselves. So my name is Doug Finn. And I'm Michelle Finn. Um, we met teaching in um, Bush, Alaska, um, in a district that was in the process of fully implementing personalized competency-based education. This was back in um, 2004. And I didn't expect to go to Alaska to find myself a husband, but I did. <laughs> um, and we moved from Alaska to uh, rural Maine, uh, from one island to another windswept island. Uh, this one was uh, eight and a half miles off the coast of Maine. I'm, I'm a Mainer, so I dragged him off to the East Coast, and uh, we taught in a one-room schoolhouse there, kindergarten through eighth grade, which for some spouses might be their worst nightmare, but for us it worked out great. Um, and we just implemented the same things we had done in Alaska with our kindergarten through eighth grade students and saw great successes. So we became really um, just hugely involved in advocating for this um, and uh, started presenting on it early with Reinventing Schools and later with Mars on our resources. So we're so happy to be with you here today and um, I look forward to you know, hearing feedback from you and also um, you know, hearing about maybe what level of implementation you are interested in or, or are currently succeeding at. So. All right, so with the topic and the time constraints and everything that we've got, I'm going to kind of run through uh, these um, uh, components that we want to hit. So at first, this is kind of the outline for the for the hour big picture framework, how scheduling fits into the into the system, then specifically getting into scheduling itself overview. And then we really want to emphasize some um, really components that need to be thought out in the design process of going through uh, developing a um, schedule for personalized competency based education. And then at the end, we want to have a discussion where it's going to be a networking, but then also a reflection. Because we're going to basically just drill you with a bunch of content uh, and give you ideas to think about. We obviously do not have enough time to go into detail in every single one of these, but we just kind of want to kind of uh, pepper it out there to kind of show you that there's a lot of things that need to be thought of. Um, and so what we've done is we've written a book about it because we felt that it was so important with that. But in the grand scheme of things, there's a lot more to it than just, you know, a standards-based report card or, a, you know, a competency-based scheduling. And so we were lucky enough in our careers to be associated with Marzano Resources. Um, and in that process, we were asked to join in in writing this book. And this was our first book that was published in 2017. And this really kind of goes through a framework of what competency-based education is coming from us, coming from all the practicing, you know, that's happened, all the application, all the theory, all the research, everything that was there. And it was a good merger because it's, you know, Marzano Resources and Dr. Marzano, who's got, you know, great uh, research. But then it was Michelle and I sitting in there going, okay, but we got kids sitting in front of us. How do we actually make this work? Um, and so we took it to the application phase. So that's really our perspective in coming into this is that students are sitting in front of us. What do we do? Um, so we can take as much theory and, you know, desire, but we have to really make it happen. So we try to be as practical as we can. So in those seven components, you really have to make sure that content is clarified. Uh, when we were back in Alaska teaching, we called this standards-based grading um, because we didn't really have call it competency-based. And to be perfectly honest, we had to make our own standards because uh, Alaska didn't even have state standards. So you have to clarify the content because we need to know what kids know when it comes right to it. Our traditional system doesn't allow that. When you say sixth grade math, B plus, that doesn't tell me anything about what they know and what they don't know. So that's where the content comes in. Then we start talking about agency and there's a ton of topics around agency that are coming within this conference and books and all sorts of things. But the idea is, is that we need students to be engaged in the process instead of being done to. Michelle and I are pretty funny examples because I was the one kid that was dragged through school and hated it. Michelle was the one that was being held back because she wanted to go farther uh, that was there. So we come at it from those perspectives. And agency is that ability to get that student more engaged in the process through a lot of different strategies and, and techniques. Then instruction. Uh, this one really comes into one of the crux issues with scheduling is that we're telling teachers to differentiate instruction to students' needs. Well, if the students are age-based, 
there's a big problem there because there's a lot of range that's there. So we have to talk about instructional styles going into different um, groupings of students with there. Then we get into measurement. You know, we're no longer averaging. We're actually looking at proficiency of learning and then we're using the preponderance of evidence to come up with a, a determined score to say, are they proficient at this particular learning or not uh, that's there. So those first four are really foundationally important components that need to be addressed. Then you get into the fifth one and you notice how will scheduling accommodate this because scheduling is a crucial component, which obviously we're going to get into. Then there's reporting. Notice reporting is the sixth one in this list. And most people want to jump to, I want to make a standard space report card. It's like, that's just a piece of paper that you mail home to the parents. There's so much more involved in this than just a standard space report card. And so working through that. So the first six design questions are really there to get you thinking about the structure of, of competency-based education. And then the seventh one is really, how do you transition? How do you go into this? And that transition can shift anywhere from three years to five years, depending on the culture and resources that are necessary. Uh, it, uh, in your school district or area that you're working in. And so what we did is we really started to come into and say, we actually have to dive into one of these topics way deeper uh, in working through this. So we literally have just, I, I do not even have a copy, Michelle doesn't either, of this book. It just got come, it just came out on Friday. So uh, we just got an email saying the books got to the the distribution center to be able to get books out to people. And so we dove into that fifth design question uh, in specifically talking about just scheduling. And this is how the book is laid out and the topics that we want to address. So there's an introduction, kind of just kind of that transition, uh, traditional versus um, um, precise competency based systems. Then we start talking about student data, which is crucially important. And we have an entire chapter about that because if you get to the point of, if you don't know what kids don't know, then how on earth would you schedule them? Uh, that's there. Then really today, what we're gonna be discussing is that overview of personalized competency-based education. Then horizontal and vertical scheduling are two different components or strategies that you can go at for designing a schedule. And then the sixth one is added to all those teachers that want to do this, but they don't have the power to make their district make changes. They can do some standalone um, things within their classrooms and try to get those components going through that. So that's what that sixth chapter is really designed into. And so the challenges that you have coming with groups is, uh, you know, if you're a teacher in a classroom and all of a sudden a, an administrator says, you need to differentiate instruction to all of your students' needs. But if all of those students are all sixth graders because it's age, then you come into some huge problems. The research that's out there is essentially saying that there's potentially five levels of learning within one classroom of age-based learning. So that if I have sixth grade age students, I could have fourth grade through ninth grade or even 10th grade on any particular topic of where they're needing this information. And you're telling the teacher that they have to differentiate instruction and teach to their needs? That's insane. This is where the statements of, I got 30 kids doing 30 different things. I'm covering too much content. So you're doing a mile wide inch deep. So it's actually, I'm covering stuff, but it's not a very good education. And I'm not at all saying it's the teacher, it's the system that the teacher's working in. And we're creating an unsustainable approach for, for teachers. And then they don't have resources. So if I'm a sixth grade teacher and I have to teach something in fourth grade, I may not actually have the actual resource itself to teach that content. So those are the issues. And what we wanted to do is really kind of come in and say, we want to create a focused instructional time for, for students so that they can learn, work on what they need to learn. That's really what it comes right down to. What is the best place for that student to learn? And a byproduct of that is we reduce the range of topics that teachers have to address. Teachers are going to literally like, Oh my gosh, I have feel relieved. Thank you so much for this because they are covering so much right now because your your you know administrator tell them to differentiate instruction, but they just have such a wide range to do that. And then importantly is we have to make sure that it, when we do put students in these groups that the the pace at which the students are moving is it appropriate for them. It's not too easy and it's not too hard. We have to have them give them a challenge level that is appropriate. So if a student were to be placed into a course, it's not just, okay, you're now in sixth grade math. A teacher just trudges through sixth grade math. It's like, no, if they only need five standards in sixth grade math, then they get those standards done. Then they move to seventh grade math. And everyone's brain just goes, but wait a minute, the traditional system doesn't allow you to do that. 
Exactly. <laughs> that's the problem. And that's why we wrote a book to try to give people the ability to say, listen, you know, summer break is not a break. It's a really long prep period. That's how I kind of joke with it. The school year doesn't end. When a kindergartner starts, they finish school when they graduate. They don't finish at the end of kindergarten. They can still go on to continue learning. It's just this continuous learning process and it just is broken up by what we call summer break uh, that's there. And so those are the components and the reasons why we wanna do this. Here's the, the hard part that we had when writing this book is there is no one single perfect, everyone do this, 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 and this. And the reason why is, is that there are so many variables in this very complicated equation. And these variables come into number of teachers is the first one. I've taught in a very small school where I was the only science teacher to teach. Well, you know what? I'm going to have to differentiate instruction to five different levels at that time. But if I'm in a school that has 15 teachers that can all teach something, then I can design those classes to be like, wait a minute, you teach science, but you're teaching this level, and then you're teaching this level, and you're teaching this level, and then the teacher is still focused on their content area, but the economy of scale of the number of teachers allows you to do this. So people think like, oh man, I've got more students I have to, to schedule. It's like, but you have more teachers to schedule them with. So that alone, just number of teachers will dictate how you're going to go about scheduling. Physical layout of the campus, you know, down south, you've got those campuses that are all sprawling and no hallways and lockers outside. We're up in Maine, where we're at, yeah, you're not going to see that because you got snow. And so everyone's got a different wings and you can get to rooms faster. Um, specials, that's going to be a huge. You've got art teachers and music teachers and CTE teachers. If you're sharing a specials teachers with someone, that right there is going to dictate your entire schedule because you only have that person on Tuesday afternoons. So you have to schedule as much art on Tuesday afternoon because it's the only time that's there. Now, if magic wand, I wish we had more money and more time to be able to do education, but we don't. So we have to start working with those variables and everything that we've got going with this. Special education requirements. I will specifically address that uh, coming up, uh, being able to go into that. Teacher-student ratios. You know, we don't want one teacher to have five kids and then another teacher having 25 kids. You know, you want to try to have some sort of equity across the number of, of there. But again, if we're doing it by student data, what is the data telling us that the students need? That doesn't the ideal, hey, everybody gets 25 kids, doesn't really matter what they need to learn, just put them in classrooms. We don't do that when it comes to uh, personalized competency-based scheduling. So kind of coming full circle kind of on this is keep in mind that you're not jumping into to scheduling. You already have things in place. Your content has been clarified. You know what the standards are. Agency is developed and functioning because when we do ask students to work in small groups, they can function in those small groups. That's one of the biggest issues with, with competency-based education is teachers organize it, put them in groups, and at the end of the week they go, the kids didn't learn anything. And you're like, you're right, because they don't know how to work in small groups. So stop putting them in small groups. We need to teach them how to work in small groups. Then we get more effective instruction occurring. So we have to make sure agency is in place. Instructional uh, strategies are in place for teachers to be able to work with more of a dynamic environment. And then measurement. Okay, this one is really cr crucial is that, you know, if you're in a system that's traditional averaging of grades, or if you're in a standards based system where you're actually reporting out on standards, those are two definitely different starting points when coming into scheduling uh, that's there. So kind of coming back full circle to that framework. And so what we want to do right now is just kind of get an idea. I see there's about 30 people um, in this group right now. What I want to do is jump to a poll. All right, and we just kind of want to see where you're at. So if you could po pop the poll up for everybody, and then if you could just answer this question and then we'll view the data. I'm just kind of curious to see uh, what, where everybody's at in this. So kind of read through these. And Doug, I'm so sorry. We seem to have an issue with the poll. I was able to launch it, Nikki. You got it? Oh, outstanding. Right. Thank everybody you, Michelle. Okay. <laughs> sorry. It's I, yep, I can see people answering. Great. Yep, perfect. Outstanding. False alarm. The world of Zoom. All right. So we're getting there about 82%. We'll just give a couple more seconds. 
All right, so we're kind of kind of across the board. This is this is good. Uh, this is always nice to know because you know if everybody put a four, I could go into some really detailed conversations and get into some you know real nitty gritty. But if it's you know kind of across the board, I'm going to stay more general. But we are going to have a, a a little bit of reflection time in in the networking for you to kind of do some reflection on that. Um, all right, so we're pretty close. Yeah, actually it's 25 because then there's three left, which is Michelle and I and Nikki. So that's everybody. So we've got uh, four and then four and eight and eight. So we've got uh, instruction assessments happening. This is crucial. So like the number two, talking about we're, we're have instruction assessments aligned to standards, but we're still traditionally scoring. Very, very common uh, kind of going into that. And then when you get into three, you're kind of going into you know standards referenced reporting so that we're, we're reporting things out but students can still move up to the next grade so they don't have to technically be proficient in the standards to kind of go into those so yeah so we've got some some pretty good stuff going on there and then we got one person fully implementing i was wondering if that was corey i saw your name on there so doing some great work in north dakota uh and, and going through that uh if not then it's it's great but uh kind of across the board all right cool and then keep in mind where you're at because during networking, you are going to kind of share this out and just kind of see you're going to randomly be put with people and just kind of check things out and we can do some um, plus deltas. What's worked, what doesn't, what are some different things that are there so we'll be able to work through that. Um, okay, all right. So now we're going to dive into essentially what we're kind of referred to as chapter three, which is an overview of the whole process and then getting into the things to think about. Um, all of those little nuggets that you may not, I want to put them on your radar essentially in those conversations. So here is the basic outline. Um, if I could simplify this process as much as possible, you have to collect student data. We need to know what students know. If we don't know what they know, then we cannot organize them on what they need to know. And I know there's lots of no's in that statement, but that's the idea. We have to know what they know. Um, so we need to collect that. You can use current data that you have. If you have district testing, standardized testing, instructional resources, anything that you're using, you can use those. The, the thing to keep in mind is, is that is it specific to the standard level? That's where we want to go down to uh, that's there. People are like, oh, I got standardized testing, but maybe they'd put it into a cluster and just call it numeration. And it's like, okay, but there's different standards within numeration. How well are they doing within those? So you can use them. And I always kind of look at it as ballpark, section, row, and seat. Okay, you know, people are like, hey, we ballparked it. You know, it's like, that's still a pretty big area. So we can ballpark things, but we want to get to section, row, and seat of the specificity of what students know and what they don't know. Then once that data is there, we have to analyze it. We propose through the, through the book is that we can look at grade level data and specific standard data because you get overwhelmed with the process of, holy cow, I got 500 kids. How do I manage these things? You know, where do I put them? And what happened in the past was, well, let's just do it by age. If you're this age to this age, you guys go in those rooms. And if you're in this age, to this age, you go in that room. Like I get why we did it, but it's not the best variable we should be using. So we need to analyze the data. Then once the data is analyzed, we want to actually look at it and say, which schedule type, horizontal or vertical, which I go into, fits the needs of our culture and resources the best uh, in working through that. So here's the type of data that we kind of convey across is that we need to start with one piece of data, then layer on the other data upon that. And I always think when I was back in college, the old overhead projectors, you know, you put the old laminated sheet on top of each other. So we want to start out with academic data. Organize the academic data, then we start looking at behavioral data. And behavioral data is very general, like social emotional information, literally like referrals to the office. I mean, anything, anything that's in there, IEP data, anything that we would be using uh, at that point. But we have to start somewhere because people jump in and they pull in all these variables and then they're like, oh my gosh, I'm lost in the chaos of this process. Stop pulling in the variables. Let's organize then add a variable, organize, add a variable, then organize. And that's really one of the, the key takeaways from this is that we're trying to be very deliberate uh, in working through this. So this next one right here is, this is actually you know, from you know, a, a 500 students. This is a model classroom based off of national testing data. So we kind of created a generic school for our example. And so looking at this data, it is a middle school. So there's sixth, seventh and eighth grade aged students in this building. And across the top, there's fourth grade all the way through 10th grade. And there's the percentage of standards proficient. 
So when you look at some of these things across here, and if we just, let's say we go to sixth grade, and then there's two columns, there's beginning of sixth grade, meaning that I've only got 0% of sixth grade done or less than 25% of sixth grade done. So I'm kind of at the beginning of sixth grade. Now I've got somewhere like, hey, I've got 25 to 75% done. I'm still kind of like in the middle of sixth grade. This is where I would kind of be grouped together with other kids that need the middle of sixth grade. And then the teacher can teach middle of sixth grade standards to all those kids. And just imagine being that teacher. I've got a group of kids that are actually ready for the middle of sixth grade standards because they're proficient on the previous stuff. And then I can actually move at a faster rate because they're ready for my content. Instead of the kid got his C in the previous class, they come up to my class and I don't know if they're ready. So analyzing this data, the beauty of it is if we, if we take middle of sixth grade and we go down to sixth grade, the actual sixth grade, is that there's 15 students in ELA that are in that location. But what I love about this data is I don't know how old they are because that's not a factor that we're dealing with right now. Age is not an issue, but those 15, they all might be sixth graders. They could be eighth graders. They could be a combination of sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. But we've got a group of kids that that's their zone of proximal development. That's their challenge level for them to be able to be learning those. Now, at this level, I don't know what standards they are. I just know a big chunk of the percentages. And I don't know what kid that is right now. Because if we went to the, the student data, I'd be analyzing 500 kids worth of data and it becomes very overwhelming. So you look at this data to organize the information. Then if I wanna actually look at that 15 kids, I've got a master list and it goes down to here's sixth grade and these are the actual standards that students would have. So this is a standards matrix that would be all of the standards needed for sixth grade. And this would tell me which ones they're proficient at and which ones they're not proficient at. So as a teacher, I would get a group of students and I would already know what they know and what they don't know so that I can preemptively plan my lessons designed around their needs. Instead of, I already know what I'm teaching. I'm following the teacher's guide, boom, 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 all the way across. If my kids need it or not, that's what they're going to get. We are getting away from that and we're using the student data to drive instruction. But we want to organize them so that the teacher has the most common group of the topics so they're not spread across five different levels that are there. So this is a pretty big document and it could be, you know, depending on the number of standards per grade level, this would tell you what they know and what they don't know. People always ask, what's our first step in scheduling? You need to get data. You need to know what the kids know. If you don't have this, then don't even move any farther because you're, you're not going to have very accurate data of working through it. Then there's the analysis of data. So if I just take one of those rows, so I take ELA, so that's the 30, the 111, the 83, and it's the middle, middle, beginning, same, same data that we had. But then we sit there and say, okay, how many physical locations do we have our students to be in? How many teachers are going to be certified to teach these actual areas? That's where this second row, number of groups, comes in. If you have that many teachers, if this is a middle school with, you know, generalist teachers, or you've got this many teachers that are uh, working with it, you've got that many groups that you can break up those kids into. So you're limited by the number of groups, by the number of teachers or physical locations to put them. So you take your numbers and then essentially you just start playing around with the numbers to say what's the best fit. If you have 30 students that are in the middle of fourth grade, and again, I don't know what the age is, but that's a group of kids that are there. Do I want to break that up into two groups of 15 or do I want to have one group of 30? That would depend on how many teachers I devote to that group. But then if you look across there, everything seems to work pretty well. You're like, okay, two groups, 15, 28, 28, 21, 29, 25, 25. And keep in mind, every one of those grades has a chunk of standards that are just that grade. They're not having to teach fourth grade through ninth grade. So the attention, the focus a teacher can have is really, really amazing in being able to actually teach to the student's needs. Now, this group on the side where it says eighth grade, middle, all the way up to beginning of 10th, that's one group with four levels with 26 kids. That teacher better have some pretty good skills when it comes to differentiating instruction and being able to work with this. Agency better be in place so kids can work at different groups and, and being able to function that's there. And if you find out that you're like, that's too large of a span, we can't have one teacher do that, then maybe you go back to the first column and take one of those teachers away and say, you're gonna have one group of 30 and then we bring the, the other teacher over to that 26 and then split that group up. 
So you, this is where you start looking at where's the best fit uh, in being able to work through this. Any of the teachers that are working in this, you would be having the certified teacher be that group. So if I'm a sixth grade math teacher, then I'd be teaching the sixth grade math group. Now, does it mean that I have sixth graders in my math group? May or may not. We don't know what the data looks like. But if we look at the specific standard data, that would get us there uh, and being able to work through that. So there's you know, tons of, you know, more about this in the book, but just kind of wanted to give you an idea of what the analysis kind of entails uh, that's there. Then we start getting into horizontal and vertical scheduling, and I'm just going to real broad stroke these uh, to let you know this. Essentially, horizontal scheduling is working across one period with each content area, and then vertical scheduling is working down through the day, going from period one all the way to period seven, if you have seven. That's there. So here's an example of the ideal beautiful system. I wish every school could be able to do this. It would make scheduling just so easy, so easy to be able to schedule students based on their needs. Everyone teaches ELA first period, math second period, science third period. But the reality is, is that that doesn't work. Okay, first of all, I don't have enough teachers to teach that if I'm in a high school or middle school. Elementary, I could do that. I've got a lot of generalists. So meaning that they can all each teach ELA. And the beauty of this is, is if that a student needs to move from teacher A to teacher F, they can. And it doesn't mess up any of their schedule to be able to do that. And so it, it limits the disruptions to just that period uh, in working through that. So that's like the ideal situation. But in reality, it's more like this where you sit there and say, hey, listen, second period actually is our priority content area. Let's say we, we, we pick ELA, if that's our priority area. Then you sit there and say, okay, but we have lunch schedules, we've got recess schedules, we've got special schedules, we've got everything else that's working through this. So we have to start working through and say, we're gonna try to schedule as many in a period as possible. So in third period, you've got your second content area, in the first column, and then you've got your second content area, if let's say it's, it's math, in the fourth column. Those two students could move from one column to the next column if they needed to for being able to have dynamic movement. That's there, but the second group and the third group wouldn't be able to do that because they're at lunch and the other one's at recess and having their electives. And so you're just working down this. The farther you get away from your, your second period, the more traditional your schedule is going to look because of all of the crazy variables that we have to deal with that's in here. So we did this in Alaska for one year and we had amazing growth in reading because we looked at our state, our school data and said reading was our whole, you know, was by far our lowest content area of, of success. So we put reading as our second period and our kids really had a lot of growth when it came to that. I was a high school uh, science, biology and earth science. I taught reading for a year because we needed reading teachers. So we, we kind of uh, looked at the, the different ways we could bend and tweak uh, certification you know, expectations when it comes to teachers. So there's a lot of creative problem solving, I would like to say, in certain cases uh, that's there. So that's horizontal. Then we get into vertical. And vertical, again, is starting from period one down to period five, just in this example. And so we would still pick a content area to be first. So if we did ELA first, we would organize all of our students based in those three teachers, because I only have three teachers that are certified to teach that content area. That's easy. It's very, very easy to do. I can put the kids where they need to go. Boom, boom, boom. Kids need to have lunch. I can have it set up because one kid needs to be in one of those boxes. You know, it's not like multiple kids in multiple boxes there. But then when I get math added, this is the problem with scheduling is that, uh oh, I've got a kid in second period ELA, and that's the level that they need in ELA, but it's also the only time the same math class that they need is in second period. So you're like, oh man, what do I do? Well, if we keep ELA as the core area, we don't change ELA's classes, we change maths, maths classes. So we would say, we're gonna move that student to another class, but by moving that student, we are now adding another level within that class. So if they're a sixth grader and they get moved into a middle of fifth grade, class, that teacher now has to teach sixth grade and middle of fifth grade. And that makes it harder for that teacher. The more you add, so if we added math and added science and added social studies, the more you're going to get more of a traditional schedule because you're going to have more co conflicting um, scheduling components with the students at the same time. This is when lunches and all the different things start adding up into this. So the farther we move across the schedule, uh, um, it becomes harder to get them to be more homogeneous groups, as in homogeneous as the same learning needs 
within each of those groups uh, that's there. So this is more of a realistic one. And so it, you kind of look at it and go, it kind of looks like a normal schedule, but keep in mind, it says math and it says first priority content. So that math group, so every time you see a math block in group one and then down in um, uh, second period for group two and then sixth period for group three and then third period for group four, when you see those groups, those kids were placed first. Then they started putting in the second one, which was ELA. If there was a conflicting issue with the math and ELA classes at the same time, they did not change the math class. They altered the ELA class so that math was that core area that was least disrupted by the scheduling process. And again, which quantitative you pick, that's up to you. They're looking at your data, looking at a lot of factors uh, that's there. But that's kind of going into the vertical scheduling. So in a nutshell, in about 10 minutes, <laughs> I kind of went through the whole process. Everybody got it? Okay, great. Go home and do this at your schools. Um, so that's really kind of the overview, big picture there. You have to have data, you analyze the data, and then you start with horizontal, horizontal and vertical. Horizontal generally works more in elementaries. If your middle school is designed like an elementary, then horizontal can work. If your middle school is more designed like a high school, then it's gonna be more vertical approach. And your high school is definitely gonna be more vertical just because of the uh, teacher certification issues. You don't have enough teachers teaching the same content areas uh, that are there. So kind of with that being said, here's things to think about, okay? And so we, in this chapter three, these are all the topics that we address. Some of them are just like, hey, here's some things to think about, and then other ones go into deeper uh, that's there. And so due to time and feedback from yesterday when we did our book club, these first five are going to be the ones I'm going to talk about. And then if we have time, which we probably won't, there's the other five uh, that are going into this uh, that's there. So then when we get done with this, if you have questions and comments, um, you can throw things into the chat and we'll try to do this, but then we're going to have kind of a networking um, plus Delta where I want you to, to discuss these things, like which area do you think would work well, which areas are going to be challenges um, being able to implement within your school or district uh, to be able to do that. So one question that always comes up to me is, what's the length of class? Should it be 20 mini classes of 20 minutes? Should it be three classes of three hours? And when it comes to determining which one is the best, we did not do the research to determine which period is the best. What we do is kind of flip it back onto the school to say, you need to determine which is best for you. Okay, that's there. Just because you're in periods doesn't mean change it to blocks. And if you're in blocks, don't change it to periods. So I love this one down here. It says merely changing the school bell schedule will not guarantee better student performance. It's all it is is rearranging decks on the on the Titanic kind of thinking that it doesn't really change the alter of of the direction of things. It's just, you know, putting a new coat of paint on it. But the idea is, is that which sets up the best. Uh, when I first started teaching, we had periods for about two thirds of the, of the school day. Then we would have a PBL, a project-based learning for about an hour and 45 minutes at the end of the day. So that time the, the students would take all the different standards that they're working on and have a topic built on their interest and it would combine everything together. So we actually had a combination of PBL, um, project-based learning and more of a period schedule worked in a block schedule. That's also, you know, block schedules is just make sure everyone's efficient in being able to utilize the time the best uh, that's there. So when it comes to length of period, we do not necessarily advocate one or the other. We do use periods is as the examples. Uh, it would have been twice as long if I made a period, you know, example and a block example uh, that's there. It's the same process, just depending on which chunk of time you determine uh, to be the best for you. Um, interdisciplinary classes. This was a struggle we had in writing this is that we, we took the traditional approach to education, meaning that there are content areas and courses. Math is at this time, ELA is at this time, science is at this time. It was a little disheartening because we do want to break the bounds of that. But if we went too crazy and radical, then it's too far of a stretch to start working through this. So we purposely kept that within there, but we do address that within personalized competency-based education, we really want, to, it doesn't require to keep those classes within classes. Project-based learning, team time, cross-curricular times. I know a school in Maine had teachers, four teachers all teaching at the same time. Two of them would take the lead. The other two would be supportive. So there'd be like a math science focus. And then the other teachers would be coming in, but the class was, you know, 
55 kids, you know, so you needed that support. So there's a really immense, unbelievable, crazy, uh, creative ways to come go about doing this. This works because you're saying, why is that kid in that room? That's what, that's what the goal is. And having that data is there. Uh, wind time is always one. We didn't go into that because pretty common power hour, uh, that type of stuff where they'll say that one hour is flexibly scheduled, but everything else is very rigid uh, and working through that. Um, then when it comes to special education, okay, this is a kind of a, a big one for a lot of people. I've got a younger brother who has Down syndrome. So I've worked, you know, with, with special education my entire life. And the kind of the way I look at it is the IEP, the Individual Education Plan, is the legal document that students need to follow for their educational success that's there. We would hope that the IEPs are designed around the standards themselves, saying what students need to learn that's there instead of just a list of strategies uh, that's there. But ultimately, IEP can be broken down to accommodations and modifications that's there. So you've got push-ins, you've got pull-outs, you've got all those things that we need to deal with. But when it comes to accommodations, the, the idea is, is that, for, for instance, I'm dyslexic. So when I'm in school, I would have accommodations for me that I could spend a little bit more time reading directions. If it's a time test, I'd have a little bit more time. Possibly directions could be uh, read, uh, read to me. Those would be all accommodations. But with those accommodations, I would supposedly be as successful as all the, all the other students in my class. Like that's why I have the accommodations. Those accommodation students can be incorporated into this data analysis when you're looking at your students because they are with accommodations, they technically should be able to achieve the same standards that everyone else has to be able to do. But then when we get to modifications, and this would be an example of my younger brother, his learning expectations for graduation were way different than what mine were because of his cognitive ability. And so those modifications, those are the driving factors. If it says that student needs to be in an age appropriate classroom, then that student needs to be in an age appropriate classroom, depending on the content. So there's a lot of factors that go into this. So we are not saying you know, go against what the IEP was like, no, use the IEP. This is the document to help us drive what students need to learn uh, that's there. So accommodations and modifications are the two categories that we kind of look at uh, in being able to work through that. Um, the next one that comes in quite a lot is grouping and regrouping. How often should we regroup students based on their needs? And so I always kind of laugh at this is if you do it too often, you're just spending a lot of time analyzing data and you're not teaching. Um, you know, people are like, we should change every two weeks. It's like, holy moly, really? Like, that's, a, that's pretty quick. Um, and, and you're changing just for the sake of changing? Like, what if a kid's in a good group and they're learning what they need to be learning? Why would they need to change? So it's not like at the end of the quarter, you have to change. You would analyze the data and say, is there a space for that student that has a better location for learning? That's really the analysis that you'd be doing this. Quarter, semester, trimesters, they'll still work as reflection points to say this would be the time for us to evaluate the data to say, do students need to be moving here and there for whatever reasons? I mean, it could be student teacher, you know, relationship issues to behavioral issues to, hey, I've excelled faster than you thought I would. I'm so far beyond the rest of the group that this teacher has to really expand their, their, their range to cover my needs. What if I just moved into another class that was already covering my needs, then that teacher has less range and the other teacher is like, okay, that's another student coming in. So that dynamic nature of that becomes very stressful for some teachers. If you're at the end of a quarter, I would not send a student to another classroom at the last two weeks of the quarter because you've got class dynamics that you're talking about, you know, that you're disrupting everything. You're plopping in a new kid at the end of the quarter and maybe that creates this dynamics that everything was running very smoothly. So there's a lot of factors that go into this, but the key point to this is only do it when you need it. That's, that's it. You don't have to shake it up just to shake it up. In horizontal scheduling, it's very easy to move students because everybody's in the same period and you can just move them from class to class to class to class to class and it doesn't affect any of the other uh, of the periods in their, in their schedule. Vertical scheduling, that does because if they're in third period but they need to move to first period, well, whatever was in first period now needs to be moved someplace else. And so that's where horizontal does work a little bit better with that. But again, it, a lot of factors play into the, what you'd be picking. Uh, that's there. Uh, then we get into the idea of students working in multiple levels at the same time. Uh, when we were in Alaska, 
we came across this issue. Um, and so ultimately, let's say you've got a sixth grade student who loves geometry and they're just like taken off in geometry. They love the sixth grade geometry. They go into the seventh grade geometry. They go into high school geometry if we allowed them to. But the problem is, is he's not doing very good in algebraic expressions in sixth grade. So he's just like, I don't like algebraic expressions. I'm just not gonna do those. I'm just gonna keep doing things I love to do, which is geometry. Yeah, I'm just gonna keep doing geometry. That's where we have to step in and say, wait a minute, to be a responsible learner, you have to have the, all of this as a background of learning. So you, I, as a teacher, would come in and say, hey, we're going to hold you back on the geometry, and we're going to spend the time that you would spend in geometry now on algebraic expressions, because we need you to move up, not move up here and then come back and slowly kind of move this up. So we had a rule in our school, just because this is what worked for us, is they could only work in two levels. So if I was in sixth grade, I could only be working in seventh grade as far away from me. If I was finished with seventh grade and I wanted to go into eighth grade content, I couldn't move into eighth grade content. I need to go back and figure out what I still needed to finish in sixth grade and move that up to seventh grade. Then once I was in seventh grade, then I would be allowed to move into eighth grade content. So we wanted to have the kids be responsible about all the learning that's there, not just the, hey, I like geometry and I don't like algebraic expressions uh, that's there. All right, I know I'm talking extremely fast and I'm trying to cover a lot of content in a short period of time, but those five topics are really the topics, you know, I wanted to hit based off of feedback um, from previous sessions that we've talked about in this topic. So length of period, what needs to work for you? Uh, interdisciplinary classes, I strongly recommend if you have the ability to do some PBL, but you don't have to, and it doesn't have to be block. Um, uh, working through that. Special education requirements is that accommodations, modifications, uh, regrouping. Um, there are set times that you can do that, but only if they need to. And then working in multiple levels, just kind of thinking about that because right now we don't let kids do that because they're stuck in sixth grade because that's what the teacher's teaching. And then when they move to seventh grade, they get seventh grade. So we've never run across that issue before, but that's something new that'll happen because students will be able to move at their appropriate pace uh, and working through that. So um, it is just a few minutes before we're going to break for our um, uh, networking time uh, and kind of the plus deltas. So um, in the chat, if anybody wanted to throw a question or a comment on the topics that I've kind of addressed so far, I'll try to get that just in the next minute or two uh, that's there. And then we will be jumping down to our essentially our breakout networking session uh, that's there. So if you want to throw something in the chat, I'll give you about 10 seconds. All right, coming in at the ninth second into there. Okay, uh, where does parent communication fall in this process? At the beginning. The biggest issue you're going to have is, is what my sixth grade kid is in a fourth grade class. It's like, nope, that's old thinking. You know, you're saying your student is in a class that your student needs. That's what it comes down to. And, and when you transition from the traditional system to a competency based system, the parents are going to be very angry at the new competency based system because it's different. They don't like different. But the problem is, is that when they, when they identify that a student is actually struggling in something, you can't blame competency-based education. You have to look back and say, it's the traditional system that allowed your child to have that gap. But you just never knew that gap was there because your child got a C and you didn't know what that C actually meant. So you're gonna run into that. So co communication right off the bat uh, when it goes into that. So the front loading of that. Um, have you ever run into a middle school organized by houses? Uh, yes, and redefining schedule this way. Yes, if you have like subgroups of subgroups, uh, that's there. Essentially, it's the way I look at it is that you've got four schools in one school. And so I would say if these kids are not interacting with any of the other kids, as in like they've got their math teachers and science teachers and all of that, then it's just a mini school. So instead of 600 kids, you've only got 200 kids or 100 kids that you have to work with. Same exact process, just the number of students would be decreased uh, being able to work through that. Uh, and there. we did see, just to pop in there, um, one of the benefits too with that is the culture building piece, which we know is so important to that transition. So we, we definitely see some positives with that as well. Yeah, it's, it's huge uh, that's going on. So, all right, 
That was perfect. Two questions, got those in. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna be doing some um, networking, but then also some plus deltas. Learn from each other, saying, hey, this is where we're at, this is what we were doing, this is a challenge we had, this is a success we had. So we're gonna randomly break you up into three groups. There's about 22, 23 people um, in going into this. We're about six minutes to go in there, so about two minutes per person. Introduce yourself, what's your role, where's your school, district, things like this, level of implementation, remember the zero, one, two, three, four. Um, and then potential experiences for positives and strengths uh, during the implementation, and then potential experiences or roadblocks that you ran into. That's a really valuable learning experience is, hey, be careful, you know, kind of working through it that way. So we're just gonna let you go out there for about six minutes, and then we're gonna pull you back into it. We're gonna rehash the, the, the plan, and then uh, we will move on from there. All right, so if you can open up the networking session, Nikki, that would be great. All right, I was asked to join room three, but I'm gonna stay out of that room. I was also invited, so I will stay out of that. So I'll click later, I think. All right, so 223. Doug, can you see, um, there's a message from Shane. He had to leave, but he left his contact info. Can you see that message as well in the chat or is that just to me? That's just to you. Okay, I took down his info. Just okay. So 2.22, pull him back, 2.23. We'll, okay. we'll close down the to break out rooms. Great. If I, it is set right now when you hit close all rooms, it will give them a one minute countdown. Okay. So, so two, we'll just, we'll, we'll do that. You've, you've got, got it? Okay. Yeah, just, uh, you can hit close about one minute before you want them to come back. Let me see if I have access to that. If not, I can do it. Yeah. Okay. I, don't think. Uh, I just have just join room. Okay. Me too. I can do it. So if I hit it around 221, it'll give them a 60 second countdown and then they'll be back. Sounds great. 
222. Okay, great. Yeah. We're talking minutes here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of stuff to cover in a short period of time. This is great, though. It's completely fascinating. Okay. Not sure, Sydney uh, Dixon. Oh, yeah, waiting. I see that too. Someone's in the waiting room. Oh, thank you. So Sydney, thank you for joining us. We are just wrapping up some breakout rooms. And so the group will be returning here in just a couple of minutes. I so apologize for my tardiness. State superintendent in COVID. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Yeah. I always interruption. So I apologize that I've missed this great session. Well, fortunately, everything is going to be recorded and Aurora will be pushing, will be pushing out the content so that you can see it. Um, in your own, in your own time. Thank you, Nikki. Really appreciate that. Of um, course, of course. The plenary session this morning was just outstanding, and I had a team on. We were all oh good inspired. So I think we're all in breakout rooms, but me, I had to step away. So thank you. Of course. What, what state are are you from? Utah. So we're we're we've been uh, dabbling in personalized learning and competency based for a few years and I've just launched portrait of a graduate and worked on some competen competencies in that space. So we're energized and excited about this. This is what keeps us going through COVID. So oh. it's yes. been great uh, timing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Nevada's got some good work going on there. Mm -hmm. Idaho's got some great work going on. So yeah. yes. Um, nice. Well, I'm glad that you joined us. Thank you. All right, Doug, we are at 122. Do you want me to give them the one minute warning? Yes, please. Terrific. All right. All right, everyone floods back. While people are all coming back, just as a little side note with Zoom, make sure you're updated as much as you can because there's the get to pick your own breakouts, which is a wonderful feature, but if you're not updated, it doesn't allow you to do that. Um, so it is a very nice feature instead of all the host management on, on this end to send people where they need to go. All right. All right, cool. Well, I hope everybody got a chance to just, you know, talk with each other and going in because that's unfortunate. You know, if we were in at the conference, like physically there, we'd be in San Antonio. I'm not sure if you've been there before. It's such a great city. It's got the little canal. It's really beautiful. I'm not trying to make us feel bad, but this is a really beautiful place. And the networking is the best part of this whole conference. Being able to talk to people that are actually in the trenches and working through this uh, that's there. So we really wanted to make sure we, we hit this as that component uh, that's there. So um, know that, you know, reach out. We've got internet so you can, you know, ask questions and, and do different things that are there. So kind of on that note, coming full circle, is that you know people always ask where's the first place we need to start somebody did that yesterday in a session i was in and it's like you need to collect data uh that's there you need to know what kids know i mean i've said that probably four or five times so far so that's really there use what you've got you can go into comprehensive assessments if you need to uh, to be able to collect information but ultimately you want preponderance of evidence a pile of evidence to say this student does know this or not know this oh uh, that's there then analysis of the data at the grade level which helps break up that information from being 500 kids down to hey i only have to look at 82 kids and then i can look at those 82 kids and say listen i need to put them into 21 
some groups of, of uh, you know, 20, and then kind of working through that. And then the specific standard data actually tells me which kids would go into which classrooms. And that's where, and then you look at behavioral data uh, to work into that. So it's big picture working your way down to more manageable chunks uh, that's there. And then there's the horizontal working going across a period, and then there's vertical going down the day uh, that's there. So those are really good starting points, but then eventually when you add more content areas, you become more traditional just because we've got so many crazy variables that we have to deal with uh, in being able to work through this. And then again, all of these topics that I was kind of hitting with the thing about, we address um, you know, them within the book uh, so that it gives you some information to kind of continue that conversation or that research uh, that you needed there. Um, on, you know, and one of those points is, you know, technology, it's a hard one to write about because it's never ending and kind of changing and working through this. Um, one thing that's there is, is that, you know, recording all of this data and keeping track of it can be cumbersome. So you really need to make sure that you know what you want before you go out and get something new. Don't get caught up in the bells and whistles and things because it may not end up being what you actually want and you're kind of tied to a contract uh, that's there. So just be as aware as you're educated as you can uh, being able to work through that uh, in, in the technology. Um, so kind of on that note, here is our contact information. Um, you can email us. We are always forever talking about this stuff. Um, since 2004, we still wake up on Saturday mornings and drink coffee and talk shop. Uh, that's there. So it is just for some reason in our blood uh, that's there. So we would love to hear from you um, and just, you know, being able to do any follow-up questions or anything that's out there. Um, again, there are resources for you. So when it comes to the handbook as the framework, but then also specifically within scheduling uh, that's there, you can, you know, get it from Mars on our resources or Amazon. Um, and then there's also virtual and, and on-site professional development that we do, like strategic planning, working with administrative groups to talk about scheduling, talking about analysis of data, talking about really we try to model uh, what we what we you know want in the classroom. So we we definitely personalize anything when it comes to that uh, that's there. So kind of on that note, it is 2:27. If there are any uh, last follow-up questions that you've got. Um, I can, you know, put it into the chat and I'll be able to try to answer that. Um, and then the survey will be put into the chat for this session for the Aurora Symposium. So with that, if you need to take a, leave this uh, group, thank you very much for joining. And uh, if you have a question, I'm here to help uh, answer. All right, thank you. And there is the uh, link to the survey right there.